Well, hello everyone, and today we're going to be in the last section of chapter four, and today we're going to emphasize stress. Now, folks, I can't overemphasize the importance of stress in the workplace. Today, we're seeing a lot of workplace violence that's brought on by stress. Not only stress uh, that is derived from the workplace, but also people who are just stressed out with life in general. We live in a time now that is more demanding, that is more stressful. Our time is very limited and our ability to cope is very limited. So you need to understand today and I want you to pay particular attention to today how stressors can be an important element in a worker's life, in an employee's life. It can happen in ministry and it can also happen in your business world. So let's take a look today in our final section of chapter four, uh, the concept of stress. Okay, everyone, welcome back, and today we're going to finish up Chapter 4, Individual Values, Perceptions, and Reactions, and today we're going to take a look at two um, uh, very important concepts that uh, you need to know as managers and future leaders, and these involve stress and fairness, and fairness, what we're looking at is the perception of fairness. Now, organizational fairness, what is it? Well, it's employees' perceptions of organizational events, policies, and practices as being fair or not fair. Now, folks, if you don't learn anything in this class, you need to understand how important these concepts are because it makes no difference whether or not you're fair in an organization. All that matters is the employee's perception, and you see that right here their perception of fairness. Uh, do I believe or do I perceive my boss or my organization being fair to me? Now, why is this important? Well, if you remember, at the very beginning, we talked about the Civil Rights Act of 91, which was amended from the Civil Rights Act of 64. Now, the new Civil Rights Act, the amended Civil Rights Act, allows for punitive damages whenever a company discriminates against an employee. Now, what does that mean? That means the floodgates have been opened for all types of litigation. And granted, many of them are warranted because the companies do discriminate or have discriminated in the past, but a lot of them are frivolous. If I just believe that I've been discriminated against or I've been treated unfairly, I can file a lawsuit and the government will hear it and I may have an opportunity to gain money off of this. So organizational fairness is the employee's perception of what is fair and what is not fair in an organization. Now there are forms of organizational fairness. There's distributive fairness. Now this is another important concept that you need to understand. It is the perceived fairness of the outcome received. For instance, if you have a reward system in place for your employees, that means when the employees meet that criteria, you have to give out the rewards equally uh, and fairly. So you can't say that, well, I'm given a $1,000 bonus for the top group that performs this quarter, and that group be made of male and females. And then you say, well, you know, most of the males have families, whereas the females are single or they have husbands that can take care of them. So I'm going to give the men a little bit more than what I give the women. You can't do that. Distributive fairness means that everything is equal. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And it's, again, the perceived fairness of the outcomes received. That means if they don't believe they got what the other people are getting, then you can get yourself in trouble that way. Now, there's another type of fairness called procedural fairness, and procedural fairness deals with the procedures used to generate the outcome or the reward. For instance, if you have a uh, plan in place for a bonus and you outline the procedures, the procedures need to be fair across the board. You can't slant uh, the rules of the game uh, towards any one person or against any one person. It all has to be fair, and the person needs to perceive uh, that fairness. 
So procedural and distributive fairness. And when I teach staffing and law, we call it procedural and distributive justice, but it's the same thing. You want to be fair in the rules that apply to win rewards, and you want to be fair in the way that you distribute those rewards. Uh, perception of a low level of procedural fairness can lead to low performance. It can lead to negative reactions such as uh, worker attrition, sick days, uh, being late, or leaving the company altogether. And then you also have what's called interpersonal fairness, and that's a relationship between you and the people who put these procedures in place. Do you feel that the people who are in charge are treating you fairly? Do you trust them? Well, that's the degree of interpersonal fairness that you have towards that individual. Informational fairness means the extent to which employees receive adequate explanations about decisions affecting their working lives. Uh, do they communicate the rules of the game well enough so that you know what's expected of you? And do they uh, uh, go come through with what they say they're going to do and so forth. So that's informational fairness. You have interactional fairness and that encompasses both interpersonal and information fairness and this is really the culmination of uh, both uh, relationship wise and information wise. Do you have a good rapport with your um, um, boss or supervisor or whoever it is, do they have a good relationship with you? Now, low perceived interaction fairness can lead to resentment of the supervisor or the organization. Uh, it can result in expressions of hostility, which is insubordination or uh, unions being organized. There's all types of expressions of hostility that can be uh, displayed in the workplace. Negative work behaviors, and then ineffective organizational communications. So you want to avoid all of these uh, if possible. Now there's another area that we call trust. And trust is the expectation that another person will not act to take advantage of us regardless of our ability to monitor or control them. So really what you're doing is you're putting your trust uh, in that organization or in that leader that they're going to act in your best interest. Now the thing about it, and here's where a lot of people get confused and uh, really get in trouble, is because they misunderstand uh, the priorities of management uh, as it relates to, to labor. Managers are there to increase the stockholders wealth. They represent the organization. The workers work for the organization. So their interests may be opposed from the very beginning, but that doesn't mean that you can't trust those in charge if they're acting ethically, if they are exhibiting procedural and distributive fairness. Um, they should be there to maximize your potential because if they're doing that, they're really acting in the best interest of the organization because it's going to pay dividends in your performance and the way that you work. And if you are uh, at a high level of trust and communication, you're going to give them more than just uh, the bare minimum. And the organization is going to benefit from that. Now let's move on to another important concept, and that's called stress. You know, a lot of research, again, has been done on stress, and we look again to the social sciences uh, and trying to understand it better. But stress uh, is a person's ad adaptive response to a stimulus that places excessive psychological or physical demands uh, on her or that person. Now, we have the stress process. Selye came up with that, and really it's what he calls the general adaptation syndrome, and that identifies three stages of responses to stress, and they are alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. And we're going to take a look at the diagram here in just a minute, but uh, identify here sources of stress. You have eustress, which is pleasurable stress accompanying positive events. You know, your body, um, let's say for instance you go to a, an amusement park, 
and you ride those rides and you get excited, you can get worn out from that experience. Uh, you go to a concert and you're swept away emotionally and so forth. Uh, your blood pressure is still going to increase as it would with a negative stressor. Uh, so there are pleasurable stress uh, factors that can still place um, um, elements on your body or create responses in your body that are just as profound as if you were expect, uh, experiencing negative um, uh, experiences. You have distress, which is unpleasant stress accompanying negative events, and we usually equate uh, most of our stress with distress, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can uh, experience pleasurable stress. Now, as you see here in this figure, usually you have a uh, uh, level of what they call resistance. Uh, the stage one, you drop your resistance a little bit, and then, and that may be because of shock or the um, suddenness or unexpected nature of the event, and then you build up resistance, which uh, in psychology they call that fight or flight. And if you're gearing up your body to resist that stress or whatever, uh, it can lead eventually to exhaustion. And again, when you go to uh, events that excite you and are pleasurable, you can get just as exhausted as you can when you can um, uh, uh, experience negative uh, events. Causes and consequences of stress. Some of the most common causes are organizational stressors, life stressors, and uh, both of these, uh, again, come from different areas. Organizational is work-related stress. Some people are stressed out at work. Some people are just stressed out by life. Uh, but you do have those common causes there. And then the consequences can be individual, uh, which could be heart disease, stroke. Uh, it could be uh, leading to depression and so forth. You have organizational consequences. When a person is stressed out at work, chances are they're not going to be productive. They may take off. They may be hostile at work and so forth. Uh, so you have to be careful with not only life stressors, but with organizational stressors. Uh, the workplace stress factors, you have task demands. Just the nature of the job sometimes can bring about stress. And you associate these with specific job uh, a person performs. Uh, for instance, you know, some people may think that being a firefighter is very stressful. But you know, if you're in a workplace and doing paperwork and demands are being heaped upon you, it can be just as stressful. So stress can come in many forms and it can take different um, uh, appearances physical demands, and that's associated with the job's physical setting and requirements. Um, some people are good working in an office. For some, it would stress them out. So depending on the physical demands uh, and the physical requirements and settings can bring about stress. Role demands. Uh, it's associated with the expected behaviors of a particular position in a group or organization. You know, there I've experienced people who have been in positions of authority, and no matter how much they were paid, they were just stressed out from the job and they couldn't handle it. So you have that type of stress. And then you have interpersonal demands that are placed upon you. And that's the group pressures, leadership, personality conflicts, and so forth. So there are a lot of demands placed on each of us as we go through this life and as we go through work. And these are just a few that you can recognize, especially when you're dealing with people, uh, to kind of see, you know, is this person fully uh, operating uh, at peak efficiency? Are they under a lot of undue stress? Is there something we can do to relieve that to make their what we call quality of work life better? Now, figure 4-8 is important because really we do need stress in our lives. Uh, stress keeps us on our toes. Uh, stress keeps us going. It does stimulate our body and our mind uh, because when you look at the extreme left, you see boredom, boredom and apathy. 
And that means the stress is low and the performance is low. So there's really nothing to do. I'm bored to death. And then you see on the extreme right, tension and anxiety, where the stress is high, but also the performance is usually going to be low also. So what you want is the optimal workload, where you have just enough stress and performance working together for peak efficiency. Now these are just a few of the coping strategies uh, that your book talks about. And uh, as we go through it, you have institutional programs, and these are design of jobs and work schedules. Sometimes people just need to adjust the, the amount of work that they do. Uh, not everybody is a nine to five person. And today we've come up with what's called flexible work schedules uh, to try to accommodate individuals with demanding life uh, um, experiences and so forth, single parents and all of that um, are people who really thrive on flexible work schedules and design of jobs. You know, how can we design jobs to be more employee friendly to help alleviate some stress in their life? Fostering a health work, healthy work culture. And this is some, these are some of the strategies that organizations who are learning organizations try to incorporate. Uh, training and development, um, employee wellness centers, and so forth. Uh, you want to make sure that your culture the, at work uh, is healthy, that it's product, productive, and it's positive. Uh, you know, it only takes one or two people to bring down a whole group. So understanding where people are um, can go a long way. There's been some places where I've worked and you really enjoyed the day, um, but there's also conversely been places where I've been and it's like, um, uh, like a prison. Uh, the culture is not really conducive to growth. It's more of those do as I say and not as uh, um, uh, I suggest or whatever, do what I say, period. So having a work culture that's uh, healthy goes a long way. Uh, and it's also the same way in church. I've had some staff people from other churches come and talk to me, and they're just upset because their pastor's a dictator or this, that, and the other. And, of course, I tell them, you need to go talk to your pastor. I said, I can't help you with these things. But it happens in church, too. There's some organizational cultures in church that foster good, positive, um, uh, a good, positive environment, and there are those that really don't. So you have to be careful with that. Supervision. Uh, do you have people over you, or are you the person that have people under you um, with a good relationship? Do they trust you? Do you trust them, and so forth? Then collateral programs, and these are programs specifically created to help employees deal with stress. Again, employee assistance programs are very uh, important uh, because they help you to cope with life. It could be smoking cessation, weight loss, dealing with stress. Uh, they offer counseling and all of that, so that can help. Now, work-life linkages. You have the work-life relationship, and that's the interrelationship between a person's work life and personal uh, life. And what we call this is really quality of work life. What type of quality do you have? Are you able to meet that happy medium that will accomplish you being able to have a personal life and a work life? There are some people who have no life outside work. Uh, they're just a slave to their job. So you have to be careful with that. And um, uh, this work-life linkage concept helps to do that. And then balancing work-life linkages. And that's the long-term versus short-term perspectives, uh, the significance of evaluating trade-offs between uh, values and so forth. You know, some people come to the realization that, you know, I don't really need to climb the ladder anymore. I don't need to do everything for the company. I have a life that I want to live. Unfortunately, many of them realize that late in life when uh, they've gotten older. But, you know, it's important to try to take into account today while you 
have that ability uh, to take a look at where your values are. We talked about that from the very beginning. What do you value? Do you value uh, the work and the prestige that comes from it? Or do you value personal life, uh, family, uh, spending time? You know, I've spent a lot of years in the workplace. And there's one thing that I've learned. No matter how hard I've worked, uh, they can do without me. Uh, they don't have to have me there. And a lot of times you can think that you have to do this and do that or the company won't survive. Uh, yes, it will. And I've even seen that in church. I've seen people who have given their whole lives over to church work. And, you know, I preach in my sermons sometimes how even ministry can become an idol. We can become so consumed with doing God's work that we forget to take time to be with God and make Him the priority. Uh, our focus is on doing the work, just like Mary and Martha. Martha was in the kitchen doing all the work. What was Mary doing? She was at the feet of Jesus, and Martha was getting upset and mad, and Mary was, or, yeah, Mary was just rejoicing, being with the Lord. And we need to learn that as well. So being able to find that linkage, that balance between work and uh, our personal lives are important. Well, folks, I hope you understand after all of this the importance of fairness, the concept of fairness, uh, the concept of stress and how it can play a big role in a person's quality of life and quality of work life and so forth. So that's all we have for this week. You have a good weekend, and we'll pick back up next week. Until then, God bless you. Well, today we looked at the importance of stress and how it can impact the worker. You know, we read in the Bible how those in uh, the biblical times are some of our biblical heroes uh, suffer the consequences of stress. I can't help but think about Elijah, who after so many miracles and after doing great things for the Lord, he became worn down. And the stress of just being uh, a servant uh, without resting and so forth brought Elijah from a man who could rain fire down from heaven to someone who was running off into the wilderness. And little by little, the devil will let you do things as long as the ultimate uh, end of it will be your demise. So we need to understand that stress is very important uh, to, to be able to recognize and to be able to deal with. We also took a look at quality of work life, balancing that work and uh, personal uh, life that we have. And it is a balancing act. So I pray today as ministers and as professionals, you're able to do that, at least recognize the importance of it so you can take steps in doing that to be able to bring about that balance. Well, that's all we have for this week. God bless you. Have a good weekend, and we'll begin again next week with Chapter 5.